In this video, we'll be looking at some basic tips to improve the manufacturability of your printed circuit boards. This is typically called Design for Manufacturing, or DFM for short. Here I'm showing the new Little Brain Plus Plus board I featured in a previous video on Altium Designer and STM32 hardware design. I had the PCB produced and assembled by JLC PCB in China. While designing this board, I tried to follow good, common practices for DFM. Thank you very much to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. I had the Little Brain Plus Plus PCB manufactured and assembled by them, and if you'd like to get one for yourself, you can go to jlcpcb.com to order, and you can find all of the relevant ordering and assembly files in my repository at github.com slash pms67, and then if you look for the Little Brain Plus Plus repository. Here I have all the Altium design files, the assembly files, as well as the Gerber files for production. Thank you also very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. You can actually get yourself a free trial of Altium Designer if you go to altium.com slash yt slash Phil's lab. I designed the Little Brain Plus Plus board using Altium and you can see the video of how I did that on my channel. In this video, we'll be looking at PCB design tips for manufacturing, that is DFM for short. Design for manufacturing is essentially PCB design taking into account the manufacturing process and the manufacturer's capabilities. We want to identify manufacturing complexities in our design and hope to simplify them to aid the manufacturing process. In doing so, we can actually optimize the manufacturing costs, thus making the PCB cheaper to assemble and fabricate, improve the PCB yield and so forth. Essentially, DFM, or Design for Manufacturing, are design guidelines that improve manufacturability. Before we get started with some tips, I have some recommended reading as I won't be going into too much detail in this video. Firstly, Sierra Circuits has a free PDF called the Designer's Handbook for DFM, which summarizes some of the key elements of DFM quite nicely. Altium also has on their website a Design for Manufacturing resource page, which is a quite nice interactive set of pages that can help you out with some DFM issues. Additionally, anything by Rick Hartley is always a good resource, especially when it comes to DFM, and he has some videos with Altium as well online and on YouTube. The first tip is to know the basics of DFM. And this includes knowing the actual PCB manufacturing process and how we can simplify things or make it easier to fabricate when we design our PCB. I've taken a screenshot here. This is actually from jlcpcb.com. When you order a PCB from them, they will show you the production process of the PCB. And these are some typical steps in producing a printed circuit board. We also need to know which files are actually needed for the PCB manufacturer. So once we've designed a board, we want to produce Gerber files, drill files, assembly files, drawings, and so forth, so that the manufacturer knows how to properly manufacture and assemble your PCBs. An important choice, of course, is knowing which manufacturer you're planning on using. I typically go with JLC PCB, and they will have their own specific set of capabilities. If you're planning something more complicated, you might want to choose your own stack up, and your PCB manufacturer of choice will usually help you with that and see what they can actually produce. So it's good to always stay in dialogue with your PCB manufacturer or fab house. Once you've narrowed down the manufacturer you'll be using for your printed circuit boards, they will typically have a capability section on their website. I've taken a screenshot of the one from jlcpcb.com and you can see they have PCB capabilities and various sections. For example, this could be the minimum drill hole size, they can do the minimum annular ring for vias and through holes, the minimum clearance and so forth. Now these capabilities are usually pretty similar between manufacturers, the requirements again depend on board complexity, and for something simple like the Little Brain Plus Plus board, you can get away with fairly inexpensive processes. This leads on to the third point, which are the design rules. Essentially, the design rules are derived from whatever the manufacturer capabilities are. So from the previous slide, you can see what JLC PCB is capable of producing, and then you would like to import those into your CAD program. Here, I've taken a screenshot of Altium, we can see we have all of these various design rules that are when we do a design rules check later after we've finished our PCB design, the ECAD software can check for you. It is important that you stay as far away as possible from the manufacturer's minimum capabilities. Even if you can go to 0.09 millimeters clearance, you should stay as far away as possible as the design allows. To do that in your ECAD software, you simply import the manufacturer's design rules and add a small margin. You don't just want to run a design rules check at the end of layout and routing. You actually want to do that throughout the design to make sure you won't have to do too many corrections later on. The fourth tip concerns proper package selection. Oftentimes QFN packages such as shown on the right here and BGA where all the pads and pins are underneath the device are much more difficult to assemble, have finer pitches, 
and are much harder to inspect, for example, for soldering bridges. A lot of times you will be able to find alternative packaging, for example, LQFP packages, which have their pins going out of the package. And this will help with yield, assembly, and so forth. You might want to try and avoid fine pitch components if you aren't cramped for space, and you can find alternatives. Fine pitch is typically deemed anything less than 0.5 millimeters pitch. A big point is passives. Now there are many passive sizes, here I've listed them in imperial units, so 0201, 0402, 0603 are increasing in sizes. Now for smaller packages you might have to pay more on assembly costs, they might have a lower yield, that means you will have more boards with failures due to assembly, and they might be harder to debug and test or replace. I typically try to go with 0402 as my smallest package, and anything I want to hand assemble, maybe with 0603 or even 0805. A problem also with improper footprint and improper component selection and improper copper pores is that tombstoning can happen. And this is something you can see on the right here. With regards to the little brain board, I did opt to choose a QFN package simply because this board is rather small at only 40 by 40 millimeters. Unfortunately, the IMU was also only available in a QFN package, but for things such as regulators and other components, I try to usually go with LQFP or packages where the pins are more exposed. The component sizes for this board are 0402 minimum and a few 0603 scattered around. You also have to be aware that JLCPCB, I don't believe, assembles 0201 components. Regarding tombstoning, footprints are an incredibly important part of design for manufacture. In particular for passive components, better footprints can prevent tombstoning, head and pillar and so forth. And you can see a picture of the head and pillar assembly defect on the right here. Essentially the component is sucked via the solder to one side, leaving a poor joint on the other side of the component. A proper footprint creation improves the assembly yield, manufacturability and debugging capabilities. I recommend looking for IPC compliant footprints and there's even a tool in Altium Designer that allows you to create some for your own. WorthingtonAssembly.com has a great page on the perfect 0402 footprint. And this is the footprint I typically use in my designs. They also have one for 0201 packages, and I haven't had any problems with tombstoning or head and pillow defects such as this. Moving on to tip number six, solderability is a big part of design for manufacturing, especially when it comes to the assembly process itself. Bad solderability can usually be accounted towards improper use of thermal reliefs or the lack of thermal reliefs, and improper copper pores. For example, if you look at a component such as the one over here, you might have a copper pore which is large on one side and just a via with a fat wide trace going to that via on the other side. This is a copper imbalance. You have more copper here, more thermal mass on this side than on here, and that could cause defects such as tombstoning. However, for fairly small copper pore areas, this is usually not a problem, but it's something to be aware of. Again, for solderability, for example, for QFN packages, as you saw on the little brain board, you might want to increase the pad lengths underneath the QFN to expose them a bit. This will help with soldering and inspecting the solder joints can be useful for probing when you're debugging the board later. Another point is solder mask, which is typically a green film on the PCB that prevents solder bridges. So effectively we have solder mask between pads and this prevents solder flowing from pad to pad, but there are some problems associated with that as well. Manufacturers will also have specifications of how they can align their solder mask, what openings they support, and what slivers they support. So the solder mask won't be perfectly aligned as it is in your ECAD program, and the openings will have to maybe be bigger than just the pad. As stated before, the solder mask essentially tries to prevent component pads from bridging during the soldering process. Be aware also that the effect of solder mask color, for example, choosing black solder mask over green solder mask can change the manufacturer's capabilities. So for example, you might have to have bigger solder mask openings, bigger slivers and so forth. Again, using the little brain plus plus board as an example, here we have the main MCU QFN package. And if we zoom in, we can see the purple layer here is actually the top solder mask layer. Now keep in mind that the solder mask layer is typically a negative layer, so anywhere where you can't see purple is where there'll be solder mask. Since the pitch of these pads is 0.5 millimeters, so fairly small, the sliver or the amount of solder mask that can get in here needs to be fairly small and your manufacturer has to be able to support this. Also the solder mask openings, which is actually the opening around the pad of solder mask where there is no solder mask, that is a minimum as well defined by the manufacturer's capabilities. And I believe for GLC PCB, that's about 0.05 millimeters. The eighth tip, and a very important one, is that of vias. The first part of vias is the drill size and the pad size. So the drill size is the size or the diameter here. 
and the pad size is the diameter over here. The annular ring is essentially the pad size minus the drill size divided by two. So essentially this distance over here. Now you can't make these arbitrarily large or small because there might be alignment problems if you make them too small. So if the pad size is very close to the drill size, you will have alignment problems. The drills they use, the manufacturing processes, aren't perfect, and you will have some tolerance. So the manufacturer will state some sort of minimum annular ring, minimum drill size. Also, if you choose a too small drill size, the manufacturer can and probably will charge you more for it. Smaller drill bits for the tools they use break more often, need to be replaced more frequently, and thus drive up the cost. The smallest drill size I typically go with is 0.3 millimeters with a pad size of about 0.7 millimeters. Again, this depends on the application and sometimes you might have to go as small as 0.2 or even smaller. The aspect ratio is essentially the ratio between the board thickness, the PCB total thickness, and the drill diameter of the via. Now, if you're using a really thick board and a very thin or narrow diameter drill, these drill bits might not make it through, they might break and so forth. Or your aspect ratio should be above 10. So your via drill diameter should be maximum 10 times smaller than the board thickness. Then we have another problem with vias being too close to pads or even in pads. Now via and pad technology is fairly well established, but it's not something you should use in everyday designs. You'll get soldering problems because a via too close to the pad might suck the solder away. Again, using the little brain plus plus board as an example, I have, for example, a ground pad here, I have a thick wide trace going out, and then have a via drilling down into one of the internal planes. You can see the via is close, but not too close to the pad here. So it's a fair distance away from the solder mask opening, and then I drill down. Instead, I could move it really close, but that would give problems with solderability and so forth. The final point of vias is tenting, which means covering the vias with solder mask at the end of the PCB manufacturing process. Tenting is good for some reasons because it can prevent shorts. For example, you have very close vias or vias underneath components. You might get shorts because the vias are uncovered. Also, not tenting vias might be a good idea because then you could use the vias as test points, for example. The ninth and a very important point is that of traces. When doing PCB design reviews, the main critique I usually have is trace widths and trace clearances. You should only make your traces as narrow as they have to be and no narrower. Also, try to space out your traces as much as possible. And you can see that in these pictures over here. And the top is how it should be. The traces are spaced nice and wide. Down here is not the way to do it. These are spaced at the minimum tolerance the manufacturer allows. So even though the manufacturer could make these traces work down here, you should space them out if you have the space. Another thing with trace width is also to consider the current handling capabilities. So a wider trace can, of course, handle more current. And if you require impedance control, the trace width will have to be of a specific value, and that depends on your board stack up and required characteristic impedance. You can also choose a thicker trace, so more copper on the trace, that could be one ounce, two ounce, or even more. Increased copper thickness, of course, increases the cost, and it reduces the manufacturing capabilities. Therefore, you might have lower margins for clearances and so forth. With regards to the little brain board, because I am running lines such as USB 2.0 and the SDI O lines from the SD card, these are controlled impedance traces. I've tried to space out my traces, as you can see here. They're only as close to each other as they have to be. For power and ground traces, I've made these much thicker and often use power puddles or copper pores such as here. A last point for design for manufacturing is that of component placement and silkscreen. For component placement, it's important that you leave enough space for debugging and assembly. If you're doing it by hand or if you're using a machine, there will be some sort of gripper to place the component on the pads. Now, if these components are too close together, you might not be able to fit the gripper in between. Also, when you're debugging, it's quite annoying to place a probe on a pad that's really close to another one, and you might short some components. Silkscreen is also a problem for DFM, maybe not as much as vias or traces and so forth, but it can be quite irritating. You will have a certain minimum size, for example, of the characters or the text height and text width, and there'll be a minimum clearance between silkscreen to silkscreen. It's important that you don't place any silkscreen on copper because that can't be produced, and that you don't put any silkscreen on holes. The exception may be for tented vias, so vias that are covered with solder mask, you may place silkscreen on those. Again, looking at the little brain board, I have tried to not put any silkscreen on holes. You can see they are on the vias, but the hole is actually not covered by silkscreen. I've tried to keep clearance from silkscreen to silkscreen and silkscreen to copper. You can see the components are placed fairly generously. Of course, things like decoupling capacitors have to be close to the relevant power pins, 
but other than that, I've tried to be fairly generous and give them a wide spacing. That concludes the 10 basic tips for DFM. There's much more on this topic and I'll leave several links in the description below this video. If you'd like to support the channel, please click the like button, leave a comment and subscribe. If you haven't already, you can check out the philslab.net website, my Patreon, the Altium Designer Free Trial, and of course, jlcpcd.com. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.